Okay, this is an interview with the great Alan Rockefeller, a figure that I imagine many people listening to this podcast are already familiar with. I've known Alan for well over a decade, and I've followed his work as it's developed over the years, and I really find him to be an inspiring figure for many reasons. Superficially, he's admirable because He's made tremendous contributions to taxonomy in the genus Psilocybe and fungal taxonomy in many other genera. He's done a great service in terms of being extremely public about the work that he's done, constantly posting his findings on Facebook and Instagram and leading forays into various habitats. And he does it all with a genuine passion. You know, the, the term open science is something of a corny selling point these days. People say, oh, I believe in open science. So, you know, we, we make these things available like it, as if they deserve a pat on the back. But for many people, it's the only way they ever would do anything. Not being public about their findings would be the exception. And that is something that is sorely missing from science, not this kind of like, oh, I'm doing you a favor by talking openly about what I'm doing, but wanting to do it, wanting to do it because why would you do it any other way? Because if you're afraid that someone else is going to beat you to the punch and scoop your finding, well, good. Add that to the sum of human knowledge. Alan Rockefeller has nothing short of an encyclopedic knowledge of the area. And there are countless questions that I could ask him. But one question I would not ask him is, how did you learn so much about mushrooms? And the reason I would never ask that question is I already know the answer. Alan learned so much about mushrooms through complete fucking obsession. When you live your life totally immersed in a subject that you care about, the question of how to learn about it becomes irrelevant. The learning is going to happen. Sometimes people will contact me and ask some variation of that question. How did you learn about this stuff? How can I learn about psychedelics? And there's a, a slightly discouraging part of me that thinks, well, if you have to ask that question, that's already a little bit of a problem because you learn through obsession. Sure, you could take a class or read a book or watch a YouTube video or listen to this podcast or any number of things. But the way that you gain a deep understanding of a subject is through obsession. There's no book that you can read or class that you can take to become who Alan Rockefeller is. That comes through complete obsessive immersion in the subject matter. And his enthusiasm is contagious. The area that Alan cares about most, taxonomy, is, I'm going to go on a limb and say this, actually quite a boring area, at least superficially, right? There are very, very few people that as children think, oh, oh boy, I really want to delineate the boundaries of different species. That's what I want. And taxonomy is an especially frustrating pursuit because it doesn't lend itself to any formal logical analysis. The rules for what constitutes a species vary dramatically, and they often vary depending on totally different metrics. In mushrooms, historically, it might have been microscopic characteristics of a cystidium. In other organisms, it might have been the inability to cross two different organisms and produce viable offspring. This is sometimes referred to as the biological species concept, where a species is defined as a population with members that can interbreed and produce viable, fertile offspring. But even definitions like that, which I think is the most intuitive definition of a species, are very limited. There are countless bird species that are capable of producing fertile hybrids, and fertile hybrids are actually more common in the animal kingdom than people realize. So if different species can cross with one another and produce fertile offspring, then what even is a species? And to some extent, this is a human construct. The 
area of the fungal genome, the ITS region that Alan uses in his taxonomic studies, is chosen because it works really well. But this is just one part of the genome, as we'll get to in this conversation. And it could be the case that later we decide that the ITS region is not the be-all, end-all of fungal taxonomy, and some other region of the genome will be deemed more important when whole genome sequencing becomes more available. And Alan is okay with all of that. But what I find so wonderful about Alan is that he's taken this very arcane discipline of taxonomy and his passion for it is so contagious that everyone around him is totally electrified by enthusiasm to find mushrooms, identify them, and even code the ITS region in order to figure out what species it is and how different organisms are related to one another. And that's really the hallmark of a great science educator, somebody who can not only convey information, but more importantly, convey enthusiasm for others so that they take part in this discipline and understand its beauty. I think this is the case for most scientific disciplines. They are not inherently interesting or uninteresting, but in some of these disciplines, like astrophysics and quantum mechanics, people have done a really good job at figuring out ways to get the public engaged. And in other disciplines, which are every bit as consequential, if not more consequential, like polymer chemistry or atmospheric physics, people have not endeavored to engage the public in the same way. And I think there's a lot of beautiful things that come out of mushroom hunting. The obvious examples would be discovering psychoactive mushrooms or delicious gourmet mushrooms, finding a healthy meal in the forest. But I think there's something else that happens when you go mushroom hunting that's even more important, which is it teaches you to look carefully at the world around you, to actually examine your surroundings. And as you learn more about mushroom hunting and mushroom identification, it is as if you begin to see things that were previously invisible. Of course, they were always there, but for whatever reason, you hadn't been trained to recognize them. And this is almost as if the nature of your reality has changed. There's an idea in linguistics called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which has been refuted by contemporary linguists. But the idea is that language either determines or modifies the nature of reality. And the way that we linguistically characterize our surroundings changes how we perceive those surroundings. This is, strictly speaking, not the case. But I almost think that if the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis were modified slightly to encompass knowledge and not just pure linguistics, that a better case for it could be made. If you don't know anything about mushrooms and you see a mushroom, it's just a, what is it? It's just a mushroom. It's brown. It's got a cap and a stem. And if you ask a person on the street to describe it, they could look at it very carefully and they might say, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's got gills too. It's got gills as well. But show that same mushroom to someone like Alan Rockefeller and it is an infinitely complicated unfolding of different characteristics how the gill attaches to the stem, the smell of the mushroom, the taste of the mushroom, the way the mycelium organizes itself in the soil, the way the spores are colored on the gill, the way the spores deposit onto a piece of paper, the appearance of the mycelium under a microscope, whether or not it has a detachable gelatinous pellicle, and so on and so forth. And yes, Hypothetically, you could have observed all of those things, even if you did not have language or knowledge to conceptualize them. But man, does it help. And the more you learn about mushrooms, the more you see them, the more you notice them, the more you understand them. And that is a very real enrichment of the natural world. So I think that learning to identify and appreciate mushrooms is one of the great things that you can do. I really recommend anyone listening to this to go out in the forest and pick some mushrooms and spend a little bit of time trying to figure out what they are. Because in that process, you will learn so much more than 
the taxonomic identity of that particular mushroom. You'll learn about mushrooms and life in general in a way that is beautiful and fulfilling. Lastly, the night before this conversation with Alan Rockefeller, we had gone out in the woods on a nighttime foray looking at different plants and fungi under ultraviolet light. And even that was an amazing experience. Alan found a plant called Chelidonium magus, and I had never heard of this. He had never heard of it either. But when he broke the plant open, it started to exude an orange fluorescent sap. And just like that, a whole mystery unfolds. Why is the sap orange? What compounds are present in this sap that make it orange and fluorescent? Might those compounds have some kind of interesting activity? And then I went and began to investigate that. And it turns out, oh, wow, the sap of this plant contains sanguinarine. And sanguinarine is a isoquinoline. And it's got a methylene dioxy ring. And it's a DNA intercalator. And it has all these fascinating chemical properties. And I wouldn't have noticed any of this if I hadn't got outside with Alan in the dark with an ultraviolet light and started breaking apart plants. So the world is beautiful and full of mystery. And people like Alan Rockefeller are absolutely wonderful at highlighting that. I've learned so much from him over the years, and it's always a pleasure to talk to him. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation. It's well known that the cannabis plant contains a wide variety of fascinating phytochemicals. It's one of the most studied plants in the world. And so I'm always amazed when researchers discover new compounds in cannabis. What was especially amazing is that in 2019, a group of researchers in Italy found a new cannabinoid called THCP that is structurally very similar to THC, but it has a seven carbon chain instead of a five carbon chain. The extension of that chain gives THCP much greater potency. So at the CB1 receptor, which is responsible for the stoning effects of THC, THCP binds with 33 times higher affinity, making it the strongest known phytocannabinoid. I thought that this would remain a obscure scientific curiosity, and I was amazed to find that within three years of its discovery, techniques had been developed to industrially produce THCP from hemp. I saw that Canaclear.com was selling it. I independently ordered a sample, analyzed it via NMR, and found that the material was bona fide. So if you are interested in THCP, Delta-8 THC, HHC, or any other unusual phytocannabinoids, go to canaclear.com. All of their materials are third-party tested for quality and compliance, and if you use the code HAMILTON, you will get 15% off any purchases. Thank you, Canaclear. It's just so easy with so little information on some of these things where you have, you know, one study that's conducted under circumstances that are not necessarily relevant to any kind of human consumption, like, you know, direct injection into the brain and it exerts some kind of toxicity and then it freaks everyone, myself included, out. But it's like, yeah, and that it, happens a lot with mushroom in the mushroom community. Like someone will write a book 200 years ago that says some mushrooms poisonous and then everyone thinks it's poisonous. But if you actually eat it, then it's not. And it's totally fine. But I like to look at the phylogenetic trees because the poisonous mushrooms tend to cluster together in clades and then the edible ones tend to cluster together in clades. So like, for example, Amanita flaviconia, a lot of books say is poisonous, but it's right there, like in the middle of Amanita rubescens and a bunch of good edibles. And I ate it and it's a really good edible. Huh. Have you ever consumed any of the psychoactive or poisonous Amanitas to just characterize their flavor? Like I'm under the impression that in Japan they eat Amanita muscaria, but they just boil it several times and yeah you know a lot of people boil the psychoactive amanitas and there's actually not just muscaria and pantherina but there's about 50 species in amanita section amanita that all have the muscamol and abotenic acid but yeah i like those a lot and i just take the flavor wise like, yeah so i just take the like a fresh muscaria and slice it up and saute it in butter until it's like 
kind of golden brown on all sides and then put a little bit of salt and pepper and they are really good like there's probably no better mushroom as far as flavor goes and texture is good too and so really yeah and so i eat them a lot um if i don't want any effects i'll just eat like between four and six bites and then if i eat like 10 to 12 bites i feel like i drank a beer or two and i start to get sleepy i don't really like high doses of that though i probably should give it another try but yeah and i don't get like any kind of stomach issues or anything so I don't know if I really believe that fresh Amanita muscaria is nearly as dangerous as people say. It might be one of those things where people just say it's dangerous and nobody wants to try it. But yeah, you cook them up and they are really good and they definitely retain the psychoactive effects. Wow, that's interesting. And I also wonder about the Amavadin and like some of these kind of weird metal containing components or even just general metal contamination in mushrooms is that something you think about a lot when you're no it's actually like way overstated like it's true that some mushrooms do absorb some metals but most mushrooms don't absorb most metals and even the ones that do generally are not very good at it so there's like a couple examples of mushrooms that are really good at picking up heavy metals a couple things you want to avoid maybe lacaria is one that's pretty good at that but it's only a problem if the metal is in the soil to begin with right and generally only a problem if you're eating the same mushroom from the same spot like every day for a long time if you kind of switch around which mushrooms you're eating and where you're getting them from like it's it's not going to cause any problems yeah yeah you've always struck me as an interesting person in this sphere because you seem like just very generally interested in everything like you're not you know, like a psychedelic mushroom chauvinist, or you're not like really into gourmet mushrooms or really into medicinal. You're just kind of like, it seems like your knowledge is just distributed evenly across everything. Yeah, that's accurate. You know, a lot of people always ask me what my favorite mushroom is, and it's always whatever mushrooms in front of me. I, I like them all. <laughs> uh, but I do st- study psychedelics more than others. And there's a few reasons for that. One is I think they're really interesting. Uh, lots of medicinal potential and just lots of interesting taxonomy. But also, you know, not many people are studying them. A lot of people like don't want the bad rap or whatever, but I'm independent, so no one can complain about what I study. So I can study whatever I want. Also, people just really like, you know, the, the psilocybe study. So I'll like post something about a psilocybe that's new or something and get, you know, thousands and thousands of people commenting, whereas you post some, like some Pluteus or something, I'll think it's equally cool, but nobody or, you know, just only a dozen people will care instead of thousands. So a lot of good reasons to study psilocybe. I feel like when we last really spoke, it was probably sometime around We've spoken a little bit, but I think it was around 2017 that I was last like really aware of exactly what you were working on. And it seemed like a lot of the genetics were just starting to take off. You were very focused on the ITS region. Mm -hmm. And then around that same time, what is his name? Jason Slot had had done some interesting work. But what is the current status of all of this like horizontal gene transfer and psilocybe evolution and all this stuff that was just starting to take off around the time that I sort of stopped keeping close tabs on the mushroom literature? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And so I've been doing DNA barcoding of mushrooms for oh, probably about 12 years now. And that's still super useful. And it's getting, you know, it's more and more people are getting into it. So, you know, before it used to be kind of expensive and not many people would do it. But like now we have Stephen Russell and Kyle Cannon here and they're sequencing every mushroom that comes into the festival. So that'll be 500 new sequences. And for every sequence that gets added to GenBank, all the others get more useful. So that's really taking off. And this is all ITS? Yeah, yes, all ITS. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. But Stephen Russell's doing this cool thing called the Continental Mycoblitz. And it's like August 11th to the 20th. Anybody in North America can be Canada, Mexico, United States can send mushrooms in and he'll DNA barcode them for free. And so that's really cool. And he's going to get thousands of samples um, to be DNA barcoded. And so ITS is the standard barcode gene for fungi. And it is still the best one, but that kind of depends on what your question is. So different kinds of sequencing are best depending on what it is you're trying to learn from the sequencing. But for me, my question is almost always the same. And that is, what is this mushroom? Where else in the world is it found? And what are its closest relatives? And for those questions, ITS is by far the best gene to sequence because it's the most widely sequenced and it's the most variable of any gene that's widely sequenced. So the ITS is getting more and more useful as days as with each day that passes just because there's more and more to compare with. 
But just the uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I ordered a bunch of new primers for a bunch of these more obscure genes: uh, LSU, TEF1, RPB1, RPB2, and beta tubulin. And I ran PCR and just uh, ran a bunch of samples with all those other obscure genes. And I got data. But when you get data for, with those other genes, there's very little to compare with. So they don't tell you nearly as much, but what they're really good for is phylogenetics because they're not nearly as variable. So ITS is super variable, which is great if your question is, what is this? But if you're trying to figure out like how the genera fit together and things like, uh, or to build a phylogenetic tree that has, for example, all of the bolletes or all of the rusulas, ITS is way too variable to get good bootstrap support on a phylogenetic tree that has like a you know, wide sampling, wide, wide variety of taxa. So by including these other genes, you can kind of combine it with ITS and get the best of both worlds. So you can see how everything fits together, the low level, but also get the species level resolution. So the other genes are good, but not nearly as useful as ITS. So there's good reasons that people use ITS. Um, but if your question is something more like, why does this mushroom produce this chemical? How does this mushroom produce this chemical? Which other mushrooms can produce this chemical? Or you're trying to do, you know, if you have like some crazy cubensis, like PE or some kind of enigma, and you want to know exactly why or how it's doing that, then you need full genome sequencing. Yeah. And the that's, uh, price in that is coming down a lot. And I'm involved in this project called the Entheome Genome Project. And it's really cool. It's with Jason Slot. And um, we're doing full genome sequencing on all psychoactive organisms, starting with the fungi. And we've got about 20 mushrooms, the full genome sequence. And we're taking all this data, um, decoding it, we're transcribing it, and uploading it all to GenBank. So this data will be free for everyone, and people can run their own analysis and really dig into the psilocybin gene cluster. And that's what Jason Slot does. He kind of decodes the psilocybin genes. And between the different psilocybes, there's a lot of very different psilocybin gene clusters. Um, and there's like, you know, five or six genes that make up the cluster, but they're, they're in, in there in different orders and different numbers of copies. And that uh, almost certainly corresponds to the different alkaloids that they're making, and how potent they are and things like that. This podcast is brought to you by Sheath, a state-of-the-art undergarment. Tailored from spandex and modal, Sheath features a patented dual pouch design for genital compartmentalization. The primary pouch cradles the scrotal sac, providing light testicular support and segregating the scrotum from the thighs and perineum, as well as the head and shaft, which are isolated in a secondary pouch featuring a micturition aperture. The separation of thighs, testicles, and shaft limits skin-to-skin -skin contact, keeping those wearing sheath dual pouch underwear less vulnerable to chafing and soothed by cooling airflow throughout the anogenital region. The secondary shaft enclosure can also accommodate other items for a natural look that is both aesthetically pleasing and discreet. Thank you, Sheath, for your sponsorship. Use the promo code HAMILTON for 20% off Sheath underwear technology. It sounds like you're most interested in taxonomy, and we were just talking with Ian and Reggie, and they're most interested in genes that explain tryptamine biosynthesis. But I'm interested in why does penis envy look like a penis? Why does Enigma look the way that it does? Why are some albino species albino? Like these morphological questions more than anything. And it doesn't seem like that has been looked at as extensively, if at all. No, it hasn't been looked at at all, but the Entheome Genome Project is definitely the people that'll be figuring this, stu this stuff out because we're sequencing the genomes of so many mushrooms. Uh, we actually got a grant recently to sequence a whole lot of different Cubensis strains. So, the, um, you know, if you sequence a Cubensis ITS, you'll get the exact same ITS sequence for, you know, a B plus, Golden Teacher, Penis Envy, whatever it is, you get the exact same sequence because it just tells you the species. But with the full genome, then you can see all the differences. You can even build like a tree so you can see which strains were uh, bred from uh, which other strains. And you can see w what exactly you know, all those morphological traits, why the enigma is doing that. And I think enigma is something that has arisen like seven or eight different times from different strains. So it's not just one thing. And I think they're really potent because they grow so slowly. So they just uh, are making a lot more alkaloids without all the biomass. Um, but, you know, this stuff is pretty difficult. A full genome sequence is about 40 million base pairs. So it's like a book that's 40 million letters long, whereas an ITS sequence is like 600 base pairs. And ITS, we can sequence for under a dollar now with nanopore, whereas a full genome sequence, it costs us around $2,000 to do a really good job 
what we do is we take some spores, we'll plate it out and um, g generate monocaryons. So we don't have like the, both of the nuclei in there, but just one, and then grow that up in liquid culture. And then we filter the uh, mycelium out of liquid culture and extract the DNA from that. So we get really high quality DNA. And then we send it off for both Illumina and nanopore sequencing. The Illumina is extremely accurate and pretty cheap, but it's like um, really short reads. So you get millions and millions of really short reads. And then the nanopore was much less accurate. It's like 99.5% accurate, but you get really long reads. So we use the nanopore as a scaffolding to be able to figure out how to assemble the Illumina data. And then we get the best of both worlds. We get a really high quality sequence that's in the right order. And to do all that, you know, like the actual money to spend to do it is like, probably a thousand dollars and then we pay some grad students um, to help assemble it and stuff so yeah it ends up being about two thousand dollars per genome so it's a significant cost but it's totally worth it because that's where you, you're really able to dig into exactly what the mushroom's doing and could you walk me through the process imagine that the question that you're trying to answer is why does penis envy look like a penis and so you have a wild type cubensis it's picked from cow dung in florida and you have a its entire genome sequenced and then you have penis envy and you have its entire genome sequenced and you compare the two genomes and there's going to be differences how do you go about assigning which genes are responsible for which phenotypic effects in the mushroom like because i'm imagining there's probably differences in many different regions of the genome so how do you go about narrowing that down and figuring out what codes for what yeah exactly when you whenever you have two organisms um, even the same species but like different strains you're going to have thousands of differences all throughout the genome and it's a really good question that i don't know the answer to because the kind of analysis i do is with these little barcodes so i have not tried decoding this data but you should really ask jason slot this because this is what Jason Slot does, and he's really good at it. So for me, the answer is I would just ask Jason. <laughs> um, but uh, he's a really cool guy, and he would definitely be able to explain exactly how he's able to figure out, you know, decode what the DNA is really saying. Pretty sure they they're looking at all the protein stuff, so like transcribe these all the protein coding genes, and they can see what it's actually doing. But there's a bunch of different open source software that they run on the whole genome, and it tries to annotate. The genome so that figures out like which parts of the genome are doing what and so that that's the annotation step that i've never done but yeah jason would, would absolutely know the answer and is this propensity to form these different unusual phenotypes a cubensis specific feature or is it just that that is the one that people tend to cultivate like do you think that yeah the same? any mushroom would do that it's just that people tend to cultivate cubensis and any actually every organism does this but it's just that in the, you know in the wild if there's some crazy mutation it's not going to uh, reproduce nearly as well and it'll just die out whereas um, you know in cultivation you have a crazy mutation people will be like wow this thing's awesome and they're going to cultivate it even more so it's kind of the opposite so you think there could be like an albino zapotecorum or oh absolutely yeah. and occasionally i run into that like out in the woods like there will be um albino just like mushrooms that are just missing a pigment sometimes it'll be in the spore color so like a dark spored mushroom actually has like lots of different pigments and if one of those pigments are missing you might have a black spored mushroom that makes red spores um, or sometimes even clear spores if those are all missing one time in mexico i found some zapotecorums that looked really crazy they were small and the cap never opened up and they were kind of like on the edge of this other big zapotecorum patch and so they came back for about three years and they died out in like 2014 so i wish i had you know could get those again i haven't seen them since and like do a full genome on that to figure out what was going on but yeah you do see weird mutants in nature and they're just not very common right and with all this increased commercial interest, like I know that you were involved with Mimosa at some point, mm -hmm. right? I mean, have, has that been supportive for you? Has that been a good development in that, like historically there would have been no support whatsoever for this yeah, sort of work? Yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing. You know, there's a lot of commercial companies that are trying to commercialize mushrooms and it's not like they're taking away the mushrooms from the hobbyists. So I think the commercialization is generally good and it definitely employs people like me that so i can just like study mushrooms all the time and get paid for it yeah and that's that's nice to be able to do so i think that's is generally a good thing mimosa failed and ran out of money uh last year so they're not around anymore but i think um there's there's a lot of other co companies that are doing really cool stuff and yeah i, I don't generally like working for places like that 
Yeah. What do you see the future of this? Uh, do you think that there'll be more cultivation of exotics or more of these kinds of weird new types of mushroom products? Or do you think it's going to be like pretty similar to what currently exists? Well, the big question that needs to be answered is like, what are all these alkaloids in the mushrooms do? You know, there's all these different tryptamines and nobody has really isolated it and tried them by themselves and in different combinations. And everybody that really has tried a lot of different psychedelic mushrooms say that they have different effects, but it really, you know, it's so subjective. So it really needs to be scienced more scientifically. And so that's definitely something that's going to be done. Also, psilocybin mushrooms have a lot of chemicals in them that we don't understand very much. Um, like a recent paper, they just ran called Cubensis through a mass spec, and they said there was like a thousand different peaks. And so that's a lot of chemicals. One of the coolest people that's doing this work is Felix Bly, and he's in Jena, Germany. He's in, I think it's in Dirk Hoffminster's lab. So like those guys are, you know, pretty much all the new psilocybin papers that come out, come out of this little town in the middle of Germany called Jena. And so Felix is doing really cool stuff. And he has um, something that's coming out really soon about terpenes in psilocybin mushrooms. And like cannabis, those will probably have some other effects too, uh, along with the beta carbolines. And Felix is thinking now that some of the chemicals in mushrooms are actually inhibiting some of the effects. So the different effects could be caused not just by the presence of the alkaloids, but the presence of inhibitors or absence of inhibitors that are maybe inhibiting some of the visuals or inhibiting some of that body load feeling. So that's probably why there's more different variations than we're able to notice just by looking at the tryptamines. That would be interesting. Yeah, I think it'll be come out within a couple of weeks. This podcast is also brought to you by Lucy Nicotine, a company that makes nicotine pouches, nicotine gum, and nicotine lozenges. I particularly enjoy the apple ice flavored nicotine pouch. It is a refreshing and well-formulated product. If you don't already use nicotine products, I recommend you don't begin. They're habit forming. But if you do, I think this is the finest nicotine product on the market. Thank you, Lucy. And in case this isn't already obvious, warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. That's cool. And what about wood lover's paralysis? That's something I'm Nobody talking. knows anything <laughs> about wood lover's paralysis yet. And there's a lot of theories, and none of them are really anywhere near being believable to me. Do you think um, there's a chance it's not real? No, I don't think there's a chance it's not real because it's been reported by thousands of people. And in like people, there's so many people eating so much Cubensis and they just never get it from Cubensis. Now, Jordan Jacobs says that he's noticed an extra peak on his HPLC graphs that um, in, whenever he runs a wood lover that's not in, um, you know, not in the non wood lovers. And there's actually a bunch of wood lovers that, are, that don't cause wood lovers paralysis because they're not in the cyanescence group. So it's really just the cyanescence group. But like, for example, Psilocybe ovoidiocystidiata is closely related to Psilocybe cubensis. And that's definitely a wood lover, but it doesn't cause wood lovers paralysis. And you probably wouldn't get it from Baocystis because that's closely related to Liberty Caps. So it's really just the cyanescence uh, Psilocybe warora actually causes it more than anything else. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah. In fact, I was in New Zealand like a month ago, and there's this one mountain where the people there uh, pick Psilocybe warora, and they say that if, uh, if you eat enough, you get wood lover's paralysis every single time. And so that's really what should be studied is like that those collections. Has nobody done chemical analysis on that species? Oh, very little. It's kind of hard because of all the regulations involved with studying, you know, psilocybin mushrooms. But I think that would be a, a really good one to do. And so people have cultivated that species in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so who knows if the substrate plays a role in that as well. In New Zealand, all of the psilocybe warrior I found were growing directly from tree ferns. <laughs> Um, which is a very unusual substrate for psilocybe. Um, so it'd be really interesting if you just to take some spores from that, grow it on wood chips, and see if you still get the wood lover's paralysis from that. Huh. I've always wanted to see that species. It's, so, it's one of the most alien... It looks like nothing else. Yeah, I just saw it for the first time about a month ago when I was out with the, um, filming the Crime Pace Botany Dozen videos. And he actually made a video on that, which is really cool and worth watching. But yeah, we got great photos of it, and it was really cool to see it in its native habitat. That's awesome. Does it? Did you try it? 
I ate like two or three of them. I didn't really feel anything. You know, when I'm out in the field, we're so busy, like collecting mushrooms and then just working on the photos and everything that I don't really have like five or six hours very often to uh, try these things. I would really like to. Um, I would, I'd love to tr tr try the wood lover's paralysis and see if I can get wood lover's paralysis. But I just, only, I only had two weeks in New Zealand and we just didn't have any time. Was the flavor unusual? No, it had the exact same flavor that I get from Psilocybe cyanescens or Lenii or Subaruginosa. So that is a pure cucumber flavor. So everything in Psilocybe gives me a cucumber flavor, but then a lot of things have other flavors on top of that cucumber flavor. Like Psilocybe neohalopensis is cucumber plus oil paints. Psilocybe zapatocorum and youngensis are cucumber plus radish. So that's, that's mostly what I get is like, you know, cucumber plus something else sometimes. Right. And what about discovery of new species in the last few years? Is that, is, have there been any major new discoveries? Oh, or, yeah, yeah. There's been quite a few. There's this really cool guy named Scott uh, Ustuni, and he's here at MycoFest right now. He discovered a new species called Psilocybe niveotropicalis. Um, I'm working on publishing it with him, and that was in Florida. So he noticed that he was finding ovoids in Florida, and they were unusually light in color, almost white. And so the sequence data from that turned out to show that it was definitely not ovoids, but something closer to some of these species that we get in Indonesia, like Psilocybe subaruginacens. Mm. Um, so um, that's one that, I, that he's, he, he finds it a lot in Florida, and we're publishing that. And then another one turned up, and um, it was actually sent to me simultaneously by two different people. One of them was in Iowa, another one was in Pennsylvania. And that one is, um, had a very different sequence than anything else, but it was close to Psilocybe Aztecorum. And so I took some gill fragments, threw it on auger, and it made these beautiful, bright blue rhizomorphs. So I'm going to publish that one as Psilocybe cerulea rhiza. And that one fruits, uh, you find it in the same places that you find ovoids, but you find it uh, really late in the year. So in November and December, it's actually pretty common. It's turned up in like five different states, it's turned up in Illinois, Indiana, and I, uh, Ohio. And yeah, it's just no one looks for psilocybe in November or December, but right before the snow comes, it's pretty common in wood chip landscaping and also just like along creek beds where you find ovoids. And then somebody sent me one just a couple weeks ago from Peru and it was really high elevation. And so I had seen the photos and I had called it psilocybe aztecorum, which is, you know, you know norm it was discovered in Mexico and it's only at very high elevations in Mexico. So it's only in those volcanoes that surround Mexico City. And so I'm like, oh, cool. They got aztecorum in South America too. But I asked him to send me a little sample just so I can get you know, a DNA sequence in GenMic to prove that it's there. And that sequence came out way different than what I expected. It was actually really close to Cubensis. And so it's the only thing in South America that's not Cubensis that has a sequence kind of close to Cubensis. And yeah, that was a big surprise, almost certainly a new species. And then there's a couple that I'm working on, this guy named Brayton in South Africa. And um, these are secatoid ones. And so there are these, uh, this, these are kind of closely related to Cubensis, but the cap never opens up. So they kind of look like witches hats. And there's a couple different ones. And so, um, yeah, those are in South Africa. And then there's one in California that's only up in the mountains. So, you know, most of the psilocybe in California is coastal, but you get up like five, 6,000 feet, there's uh, a couple different psilocybes that don't open up. One of them doesn't have a name yet, and it's just kind of like a kind of kind of chunky psilocybe, but yeah, the cap never opens. And that one's closely related to psilocybe hopii, which was described from Arizona. And then there's another one that was described from Mount Shasta in 1937 called Galeropsis polytrochoides. And the genus Galeropsis is defunct because the type species of Galeropsis turned out to be a pineal but I found Galeropsis polytrochoides and I sequenced it and it came out right next to Psilocybe polyculosa and Psilocybe alutacea. So um, that's another Montane California Psilocybe. So yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of, of new species and the more people look and the more people are barcoding stuff that they're finding, the, the more that turn up. That's yeah, that's amazing. And do you talk with the people that do cultivation? Like, do you know the backstory? You, you mentioned that Enigma type mutations have been observed multiple times, but I haven't 
heard the story on how that was discovered. Do you know who is the first person to create that? I'm not super into cultivation, but just being around all the mushroom people all the time, I pick a fair amount out. So in Enigma, is, it's like there, people are growing a tub of mushrooms and they just see a little blob in the corner and it never turns into a mushroom and they'll just grab that and clone it, throw it onto auger. And then when they uh, make spawn out of that and spawn that to a tub, they just, instead of getting mushrooms, they get these weird fan shaped you know, things that stain blue really well. And so that was the original Enigma. And it turns out that it's actually not an uncommon mutation. And so uh, like uh, Tidal Wave 2 is a really potent one that Dama Nunzio um, isolated in New York. And then this one um, that I've seen around here, like somebody has a tub of it a a around. And he said that was, uh, he, you know, what did, what did he call it? He's, yeah, he said it was some kind of... Um, Oh, I forget what he said it was, but it wasn't like one of the standard enigmas. It was just like, I, don't, I forget if he said B plus or so, something like that. But yeah, it turns out like any Cubensis can just stop making fruit bodies and just start making these weird fan-like growths. And they grow really slowly. So it takes a tub like two or three months to mature, but it's making psilocybin the whole time. So it has two or three months to make psilocybin instead of just a couple weeks to make psilocybin like a regular cube. So that's why they end up being so strong. And have you looked at these microscopically? Actually, yeah, through Tidal Wave 2 under the microscope, and I was really surprised. And what I what I threw under the microscope was just a little bit of mycelium from a Petri dish, just a little bit of the leading edge. And I throw a lot of mycelium under the microscope, so I pretty much always know what to expect. It's always the same thing, you know, just like the, the thre threads, the strands with the septa and then the clamp connections around the septa. But with the Tidal Wave 2, when I threw that under the microscope, I did see that. But in addition, I saw these really wide hyphae. They were like 10 to 12 micrometers wide, so quite a bit wider. And then they had these big vacuoles, so almost like eyeballs up and down the hyphae. So it was crazy looking. I've never seen that in any other hyphae ever. And I thought like, am I just like going crazy? So I sent a plate to my friend in the Netherlands and he scoped it and he saw the same thing. So um, I wonder if that's like common to all Enigma type things or if that's in Tidal Wave 2. And it almost certainly has something to do with the mystery of why it's doing that. You know, and the, the morphology is different, not just in the fruits, but in the vegetative mycelium. This podcast is also brought to you by Matcha.com. Grab a traditional matcha bowl or your favorite mug and enjoy a hot cup of matcha first thing in the morning. I don't drink coffee, but I think matcha is a wonderful way to start the day. It contains L-theanine, it contains caffeine, which is what I'm most interested in, and it has all sorts of purported health benefits. Matcha.com was founded by psychedelic pioneer Dr. Andrew Weil. All of their matcha is imported from Japan and third-party tested for heavy metals. It's delicious, probably healthy, and certainly stimulating. So enjoy a cup of matcha from matcha.com. Right. And... There are other mushroom species not in the genus Psilocybe that have some structural similarity to this, right? Like, is there anything else that you've seen? Aren't there some kind of... Somebody sent me some golden oysters um, that were doing that. Like, they never really made actual oysters, but they were just kind of making almost like sclerosure or truffles. And they cooked them up and ate them. And they were like, yeah, they're like golden oyster truffles. So, yeah, I think any mushroom can do it. It's just that when it doesn't happen to a psilocybe, no one really pays attention. Right. And there isn't a word for this. This is like a... No, there's not really not really a good word. It's definitely a mutation, but I can't think of anything more specific. It's so weird. Yeah, I'm really... And no one has even published this scientifically. Like, this remains... No. And, you know, usually varieties don't get published scientifically, but they could. You know, the scientific names would have to be either Latin or Greek. So I don't know if, like, exactly Enigma... Uh, but, you know, maybe that has a Latin root that's kind of similar and you could publish a Psilocybe cubensis variety enigma. Um, I think it'd be a reasonable thing to do to publish some of these cubensis strains as varieties just to give them an official scientific name. Uh, but with something like PE, it's hard to make, you would have to like, you know, it's hard to make a, a Latin or Greek name out of that that would sound reasonable. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, I mean just even like some kind of scientific acknowledgement of this intense spectrum of mutation that's been observed yeah. in cubensis. Yeah, I think that should be done. You know, there's really no money in taxonomy. And so there's no one that's going to get paid to do something like that. Uh, but somebody definitely should do it. 
And then I remember when we were last talking about Tampanensis, there was an idea that it was synonymous with Megicana, and then you said that that oh, had changed. A little bit different. Um, so there's actually two species. Um, one species is Psilocybe tampanensis, uh, described from Tampa, Florida. And then there's Psilocybe mexicana, described from Watley, Watley de Jimenez, Oaxaca. And then people have a bunch of different names that have all traded around over the years, but they're all either one of those two species. So I've started doing a lot of DNA sequencing on that, and they all come out either as Mexicana or Tampanensis. So like Psilocybe Atlantis is actually a synonym of Tampanensis. So Tampanensis is pretty rare in Florida, but it's actually really common in Georgia and the Atlanta area. Um, it also turned up in South Carolina last year. Somebody sent me a sample from a lawn in South Carolina that was also Tampanensis. It turns up sometimes in Louisiana, Mississippi, and probably occasionally all the way over to like Dallas. But that's a pretty well-known species now that's you know, very closely related to Mexicana, but definitely different, both in morphology and sequence. And what is the difference? Because I remember there was a time where they were considered synonymous. So what changed or what was Yeah, the... well, they were synonymized based on just microscopy. But it turns out microscopy is not a very good way to differentiate closely related species because closely related species generally have very similar or overlapping microscopic characteristics. So it's really just sequence differences, but also I find a lot of Mexicana out in the field in Mexico, and it always looks different than Psilocybe tampanensis. The cap in Mexicana is darker brown and much more striate. Interestingly, when people cultivate Mexicana and when they cultivate tampanensis, I can't tell them apart. So I can't tell a tampanensis grow from a Mex Mexicana grow apart without looking at the sequence data. But these are definitely verified cultures that are sequenced, so I know that they're really different, but they only look different in the field to me. And then, you know, yeah, somebody's grew a bunch of Mexicana in their garden in Florida. It looks just like Tampanensis. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of interesting. And then, have you seen any Ovoidio cystidiata during this hunt? Are we going to find any psilocybes in um, Pennsylvania right now? It's a little right late now? in the season. This is really good ovoid country around here. Um, and if, if we were to hunt like along stream beds where the kind of de decaying wood piles up, we'd find a lot. And people were finding them as recently as a couple weeks ago, which is unusually late for Ovoidio cystidiata. But I don't think they're around now. Or if there are, there'll be like one or two where there would be 10,000 a couple months ago. Damn, I'd really like to see it. I've never seen it in nature. Yeah, I've never seen it in nature either. I, oh. I've I photographed some that um, that were in my backyard once, and I got reasonable pictures there. But um, but yeah, I'm like I'm never in the East Coast in like May or June, so I've never seen it in person, just in the wild. But I, I would love to go out and get really good photos of that. Because I keep hearing all these strange. Someone wrote to me and said that the mycelium has an extraordinary smell, and someone else was showing me these photos of these insane mycelial rhizomorphs that were. Yeah, like, yeah, I saw those. They're really it, cool, and yeah, um, it d definitely has a kind of interesting smell. And sometimes people notice the smell before they find the mushrooms. That's. I mean, is that, have you heard of that with any other species? Yeah, with candy caps. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that definitely happens. And Matsutake as well. Yeah, yeah. Or like, you know, Agaricus xanthodermis has that really strong phenolic odor because it actually has phenol in it. And if you're kind of like digging through the duff, sometimes you get hit with that and you'll, and it'll just be a bunch of Agaricus mycelium. It's not fruiting right now, but you can tell what it is from the smell. Wow. And have you discovered any new species recently? You must have discovered all kinds of Most things. Most of the new species I discover are in my mailbox because people are always mailing me stuff. But, you know, because there's like so many people that are kind of looking out for psilocybes and whenever they find a psilocybe that they can't put into one of our well-known boxes, they'll just mail it to me. And so I sequence it and... You know, most of the time it turns out to be just like a known species, but not all the time. But when I'm out in the field, I photograph a lot of stuff and I collect a lot of stuff and I sequence it all. And I'd say about 25% of what I collect ends up being new species. So, you know, with, with plants, discovering a new species is very difficult and you, you're lucky to discover a few new plants in your lifetime. But with mushrooms, you can easily see 50 new species in an afternoon. And that's cause, just because there's no money in taxonomy. There's not many people naming species right now. And it's kind of like kind of specialized knowledge. The, uh, it's mostly the microscopy that kind of gets people... Uh, stuck because microscopy is really hard and to do a good job on microscopy of a mushroom is very time consuming. It actually takes me just about all day. I'll spend like two or three hours 
taking the actual pictures and then a few hours processing the photos. So to do a really good job is really time consuming and it's really hard to learn. It took me a long time to learn. So I think that's the major stumbling block for describing new species. Also, just a lot of people just don't realize that it's you know possible and, and, and not super hard. Yeah, but, what, is, what is the process for somebody that doesn't know anything about this? Well, if it they actually got a start. lot easier recently. So um, I think it was 2012 was the year they changed the botanical code of nomenclature. And it used to be that you had to write a Latin diagnosis. So that means you just had to write like a description of the mushroom in Latin. And also it had to be published in a peer reviewed journal. And neither of those things are the case anymore. So uh, right now, um, you can publish, you, you can just put a PDF online and that's valid publication and it doesn't need to be peer reviewed anymore. Oh, but I mean, for someone that is, you know, they want to go out into the woods and have some hope of identifying some mushroom that they stumble across, what would you say is a good process for that neophyte to begin to start identifying even the genus that a mushroom might occupy? Yeah, so it's definitely a good idea to, to photograph all the mushrooms you see, especially the underside and um, add those photos to iNaturalist. And iNaturalist has an app that works really well. So when I'm out in the field, if there's, you know, anytime I see a mushroom, I'll take a photo with the iNaturalist app. And it's really cool for trees. You can put trees, bugs, birds, animals, anything in nature on iNaturalist, and then people will identify them for you. And it also has an AI that's pretty good. Um, if you take a, a picture of a mushroom where you can see the top of the mushroom and the underside of the mushroom in the same photo, the iNaturalist AI is surprisingly good and it can identify it most of the time. Um, but you know, iNaturalist creates a database that's like a permanent record. So people go through these observations and you know identify them by hand. And then if I see something that's really cool in there, I'll, I'll either go to the exact coordinates because by default, it'll just put the exact coordinates, make them public. Um, although you can hide them if you want, but I'll just go there in person and then like, you know, make a really good scientific collection or a message to the person and be like, Hey, could you collect that for me next time you see it? So I get a lot of collections that way. And that's a really good way to keep track of what you found and learn what's in your area and add to the documentation. And then whenever I collect any mushroom, whenever I photograph any mushroom, I collect everything I photograph and I usually dry them on my dashboards, leave them on my dashboard for a few days. And then I label those dried mushrooms with the iNaturalist number. And then later when I get the microscopic data and I get the DNA sequence data, I add that all to the iNaturalist observation. So there's like one point and then where all the information is. And then I add it to GenBank too. And the GenBank record points back to iNaturalist. And then people can comment on it. And if somebody else gets a matching sequence, they might comment like, oh, cool, I found this same thing somewhere else. Um, but you know, really, if somebody suspects they found a new, a new species, the DNA barcoding is really the best way to do that. Uh, because you know, a lot of times, like you won't really realize what it is, especially if it's kind of half dried out or it's an atypical form. But the DNA barcoding can untangle that. I mean, the most powerful thing that DNA barcoding does is it ties the collections together. So like, for example, we have 80 species of red russula in North America, and they're almost impossible to disentangle. But with the DNA barcoding, you can tell exactly which other collections are the same. So you might get a list of a dozen other iNaturalist observations, and you can kind of look at all 12 of those. You know they're all the same species because they have the same DNA barcode. And then you can start to see like what this range of variation is for each species. And that's how you can learn how to actually del delimit species. So if people are just finding mushrooms, they should really be saving them. And I used to teach a lot of people DNA barcoding, and I do that a little bit now, but it's almost not a good use of people's time to learn DNA barcoding, unless it's just something they want to learn for their own curiosity. But um, these days, I mostly teach people to make good collections. So how to take good professional quality photos, uh, what to write in the notes. So anything that's not obvious from the photo should be written in the notes. And that's something that you can do in the iNaturalist app too. Like before you forget the taste, the odor, the nearby trees, um, the texture, and then you know save the dried collections. And those can all be sent to someone like Stephen Russell or Kyle Cannon. And these guys are running nanopore sequencing. So they're able to sequence thousands of mushrooms for like a hundred bucks. But they have to, it's the same price if they're doing 960 mushrooms or if they're doing one mushroom. So, you know, it makes sense for people to make a lot of good collections and then just mail those in to somebody who's doing nanopore sequencing. Because, um, you know, somebody who has that setup going, they, they have way more sequencing capacity than they have mushrooms to work on. And so having more and more collectors, more people just sending mushrooms in is how we're going to get more DNA sequence data and, you know, get more work done. Right. 
And, uh, and yeah. we've discovered so many new species, like hundreds. Like, oh, you hear 500 collections came into MycoFest, and I guarantee you between one and 200 are new species. And so we're not going to publish them but, uh, with the holotypes here, but we're not going to make a holotype out of what's here because these are not like awesome collections. It's just like somebody thought it was cool. They threw it in their basket or in their taco box. But, you know, it's usually just like one or two mushrooms that are out there on the table. So we get a lot of DNA barcodes. But then Stephen Russell saves all these collections. So when we do describe, decide, decide to describe it as new, um, it's best to study more than just one collection. So if you have like two or three collections um, and then like these little collections that we're saving from here can be really good studied collections just to see like between collections, what's the variability in microscopic features and you know, and macroscopic features, how variable is each species. And then when you're writing up a new species, you can include all these other observations in your description and you'll be able to write a much better description. And that's been a real problem in mycology is that people find a mushroom one time, they write it up, but they don't realize the full range of morphology that it can have. And so by having a lot of you know, collections that are all tied together through the DNA, then we can actually you know, write a good description that encompasses all the different variety that it can have. We, we got the rectal kratom guy right off camera right now. I mean, this is what you're telling me. I don't know if that's <laughs> boofing kratom. It's become a meme on the internet. This is a kratom tea product. It's not intended for boofing. Even if the pH of the human rectum is between seven and eight, and the pKa of metragenine is 8.1. That's just not really relevant here. This is a tea consumption in hot water. That's what it's for. That's what it should be used for. If you want this tea, you can get it at toptreeherbs.com. Has anyone discussed integrating chemical analysis into this process? Very little, and I think that would be really interesting, and that's something I'd really like to do because after I do the work of DNA barcoding a mushroom, I'd really like to run it through like an LCMS and get some kind of chemical fingerprint. Because um, even if you didn't identify, then maybe in aggregate, you might start to notice, oh, all the mushrooms in this genus, they all contain a peak with this molecular yeah, weight, exactly. and maybe it's worth investigating what that thing is. Absolutely, and that's like a good you know, apomorphy for like, you know, certain genera or certain sections of genera. Um, and I think there's so many really cool chemicals to be discovered in mushrooms. And it's just like you find a mushroom, if you throw it in the LCMS and you find some chemical in there that's useful or valuable, you can culture it and brew it up in a 10,000 liter bioreactor and make a whole lot of that molecule. And I think that's, you know, it'd be a really cool thing to do that's actually worth real money is to, you know, find valuable molecules in, you know, in fungi. And that's something I'd really like to do in the next few years is, is do more tech chemical analysis. What I really want is like a team of 10 people to work with me. And so I would, be, I would like go out and collect mushrooms all over the world and then send them back and have like a couple chemists to do analytical chemistry and some taxonomists to do, uh, to like publish all the new species and then some people culturing all of these things. And I think I'd find like so many valuable molecules that it would easily pay for a research team. But that's that's my plan for the future. Oh, that sounds great. I agree, of course. Yeah, you would definitely find amazing things. There's almost no way that you wouldn't. Yeah, like the main main stumbling block is just getting really good chemists that can take, you know, take a mushroom and throw it into an LCMS or NMR and then know like what's valuable and have like be able to hypothesize what's useful, what's worth pursuing or what's, you know, just common and not really worth going after. Yeah, that will be difficult because characterizing the structures of these things is non-trivial at the moment and that's why i was thinking maybe in aggregate it might make more sense where you might notice okay all of the mushrooms in this genus all have this peak maybe it's worth isolating that peak and figuring out what that is because maybe this is some kind of biologically important component of Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a really good genus to do that with would be psilocybe since it yeah. makes so many cool chemicals anyway. And then just if you could see like you probably see certain peaks in certain sections of psilocybe. It's like you probably see extra peaks in the wood lovers. And um, it, you know, dovetail with the work that Jason Slot does when you see um, like different copies of the psilocybin gene that's going to correlate to different chemistry in the mushrooms. So to be able to just like align all the species and then align in like all the, the chemical uh, chromatograph and everything would be really cool. Yeah. And then as a, a final thing, I think it's probably pretty distant from your day-to-day -day concerns, but for an average person who is interested in 
going out and hunting for mushrooms, they're afraid of poisoning themselves. And that's kind of like the, the main, if you ask like a person on the street, like, do you want to go mushroom hunting? They'd say, oh no, I would, I would poison myself. How much of a concern is that for the average person? And how do you best avoid it? And have you ever had any accidental exposure to toxic mushrooms? Is that a real thing that people should be worried about? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's not very much of a concern these days because it's so easy to get your mushrooms identified. So I can accurately identify any mushroom from a photo. Um, and I can't always tell exactly what species it is, but I can always tell if it's poisonous or not because the poisonous mushrooms all kind of group together and the edible mushrooms all kind of group together. So if somebody just goes out and finds a mushroom, they should just take good photos of it, including the underside. And um, a really good place to get stuff identified is Facebook. There's a lot of Facebook groups. I think I studied, started a group called Mushroom Identification that has like 400,000 people. So you post the mushroom photos in there and you can get lots of eyeballs on it very quickly. And occasionally people will misidentify it, but you know, if you get a few people that say the same thing, or you know, but you know, moreover, it's like somebody suggests a name, and then you Google that name, or well, you have the mushroom in your hand, and then you can, you know, look at it and be like, oh, okay, is that it or not? You know, there's no mushrooms that are so poisonous that you can't touch them, and there's also no mushrooms that are so poisonous that you cannot taste them. So even deadly mushrooms. Whenever I find deadly mushrooms, first thing I do is take a big bite out of it and chew it up. Uh, just because I, I think it's interesting. Most deadly mushrooms don't have a lot of flavor, but some of them taste like cucumbers, sort of. Like the deadly gallerina tastes just like psilocybe to me, the same cucumber flavor. And that's not surprising because they're not too distantly related, so it's probably the same chemical. I think it's like a nonanol. Uh, one of those alcohols gives you that cucumber flavor. Huh. Same uh, chemical that's actually in cucumbers. But... Um, yeah, I taste all the mushrooms and to really get poisoned by a mushroom, you have to eat a pretty significant amount. So for like Gallerina marginata, it's deadly poisonous and you eat it and it stops protein synthesis. So you're fine for 12 hours and then you get real sick and you die within a week. Uh, but you can get a liver transplant so you won't die. But a new liver is $800,000 with installation. So um, definitely best to identify the mushrooms first. But it's totally fine to pick any mushroom. And I encourage people to pick all the mushrooms they see, bring them back home, spore print them, you know, look at, see how they change over time, how they change color as they dry out, you know, what color spores they drop. And just, you know, you know it's just cool to like bring all the mushrooms home, throw them on your table and just take a close look at them once you get out of the field. And, um, you know, it's totally fine to taste any mushrooms. Some of them are very spicy. Uh, there's some of the Rusulas and Lactarius, they're like as spicy as a habanero or some of them. It's like, but it doesn't taste quite like a habanero. It's more of a burning, like a horseradish. Uh -huh. um, that's caused by sesquiterpenes. Uh -huh. um, and they're not heat stable. So if you dry or pickle or cook these mushrooms, then you can eat them. But raw, they're super spicy. And then some mushrooms- And not in a desirable way? Not really. They're kind of unpleasant. <laughs> Some mushrooms are super bitter. I tasted a Tilopolis yesterday that was, oh, wow. It was yeah, my, my mouth was so bitter for half an hour afterwards. Huh. Uh, but some people use like a little bit of that, uh, like when they're brewing beer to give it that bitter flavor, like in place of hops. Um, but, you know, mush there's so many people that are identifying mushrooms these days more and more that is really easy to get your mushrooms identified. So just make sure that you're sure exactly what it is, um, you know, before you eat anything and you'll never get poisoned by mushrooms. Uh, people also overestimate the danger from poisonous mushrooms. So really only about 1% of mushrooms are deadly. 80% of them are edible or kind of tough, but, you know, won't hurt you. And then maybe like 10, 15% are poisonous, but not deadly. So very few people actually get poisoned by mushrooms. And the people who do get poisoned by mushrooms don't make any attempt at all to identify them. Um, it's very rare that somebody identifies it wrong or somebody on the internet tells you the wrong name and then you get poisoned. Um, it's more like people, you know, with like poisonous plants, they tend to taste really bad. So people think, oh, a poisonous mushroom will taste really bad. But poisonous mushrooms actually taste just fine. Like they don't taste bitter. They don't taste weird. Uh, the, the deadly amanitas taste maybe a little bit like corn husk a little bit. It's not an unpleasant flavor at all. Um, in fact, in Mexico, I picked a bunch of Amanita bisporidra, which is deadly poisonous. It has the alpha aminitin that stops the DNA replication by gumming up the ribosomes. So same thing as in a death cap. And so I picked a bunch of them. I sliced them up. I uh, sauteed them, um, you know, with some butter and 
then you know tried them just like ate, ate them chewed them up a little bit and then spit it out and they were quite good i mean they weren't awesome they weren't any but they weren't any better or worse than any other edible mushroom like they were good hmm. um and then we buried them so the dogs wouldn't find them um and, you know because the heat the toxins are definitely heat stable um so that's responsible yeah yeah um, didn't, didn't want to kill anything else but um but the only time i've ever been poisoned by mushrooms um i did it on purpose because there's this mushroom called turbinellus flacosis or scaly chanterelle and in the united states people are very scared of this mushroom they say it's really poisonous but in mexico they sell it in markets and you can like go to a restaurant and order like tacos of this mushroom and so I was kind of doubting that it was actually poisonous. So I picked a whole bunch of them at Nevado de Toluca, one of those good uh, good for mushroom hunting volcanoes near Mexico City. I brought it back and I made like a whole bunch of different dishes. Every dish had like a different preparation of Turbinellus flacosis. And so um, ate a whole lot of it. And in the morning I had diarrhea and then I was fine after that. So um, yeah, it's definitely poisonous, but I would eat it again, just not like kilos and kilos of it. <laughs> Okay, that's good. That's good information. And final question, were you able to identify what that orange resinous plant was that you found during the ultraviolet foray last night? Yeah, I did. Um, it's a plant that I had never seen, uh, never seen before, but it was beautiful in ultraviolet light. Um, you know, the leaves were fluorescent bright red from the chlorophyll, but the um, it had these kind of like bean pods that were sticking up and they were fluorescent bright, bright golden color. They were just beautiful. And so um, I just took a picture of it and I put it on iNaturalist and the AI was able to identify it just fine. And I knew it would because like with plants, if you have the flower or the seed pod and a leaf in the same photo, the AI does a really good job. So it ended up being Chylodonia magus, and uh, the, like it's got some common names like tetherwort. It's a common name, but yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Okay, all right, mystery solved. Yeah. So, and for anyone that's interested in your work, how can they follow what you're doing? So I have a website. Um, it's called Mycena. So that website is mycena.llc, and that's where I post a bunch of uh, you know photos I've taken and some like new discoveries and stuff like that. So they can follow it on there, and kind of like sign up for a mailing list on there. And then I'm leading a mushroom hunt in Veracruz, Mexico, in September. Um, it's one of the parts of Mexico that has some of the most psilocybe diversity. So if people want to go to Mexico and you know, walk around the woods for a week looking at cool mushrooms and learning photography and identification, um, you can send me a message and I can send you the information on that. I also post all of the mushrooms I find on iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer. So these are those citizen science mycology websites. They can follow me on there. Uh, and then I also have Facebook and Instagram. So it's just Alan Rockefeller on Facebook and Instagram. And that's a good way to get a hold of me. And then you can see all the stuff that I've been finding as well. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.